so kick the praise and worship man off. Um, but where is Chris? <laughs> you know, take a thing. Grace, where's Chris? You don't, Chris? I, 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 let me call. Let me call this senior pastor. <laughs> hey, Chris, where are you? You're supposed to be here. Come on. Hey. Oh, no. Um, sure. Uh, can you let everyone know that uh, I'll be there in about three minutes? Um, I think I can get everything ready. We live in pretty modern times now, so uh, I'll just stand by, watch your WhatsApp messages, and I'll give you some instructions. See you guys soon. Okay, bye. Hey, Juniper, I'm going to give you a series of instructions, and I need you to listen to all of them and implement them as I go. Uh, I don't need you to give me any feedback. Of course, Chris. What do you need help uh, with? The first thing I need to do is prepare uh, an amazing introduction for the service. Uh, I want to sound really impressive, like I know a lot about the Bible. Um, we are doing Psalm 103 verses 1 to 2. It's Bless the Lord, O My Soul, and the series is called Genuine Praise Today. So can you write up um, an introduction for me? Also, I would like you to compose a song about that psalm. Uh, ideally, something that's a bit catchy so that our congregation can remember the psalm. Also, can you WhatsApp the worship team? I need them to clear the stage, get the lectern out, and maybe if they could also uh, get ready their instruments because they're going to take over uh, from your song at the end of it. Uh, looks like I'll be arriving pretty soon. Um, Juniper, could you also activate my robot vacuum cleaner at home and send a message to Uber Eats. Uh, I would like a large Big Mac meal uh, with Coke no sugar uh, delivered to me while I am preaching. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, let's dive into the rich tapestry of Psalm 103, 1 2. Did you know that this psalm, a masterpiece of Davidic literature, contains 22 verses corresponding to the Hebrew alphabet, symbolizing the completeness of God's praise? Recent studies have unveiled that the phrase, Bless the Lord, O my soul, Barkai Nafshi et Adonai Barki Nafshi et Adonai, is an ancient Hebraic idiom, indicating a total, unwavering devotion to God. In the realm of modern pastoral techniques, Psalm 103 has been pivotal in developing cutting-edge spiritual practices, such as gratitude journaling and mindful worship, both scientifically proven to enhance mental and spiritual well-being. In fact, a recent study from the Harvard Divinity School highlighted how incorporating Psalm 103 into daily meditation routines significantly reduces stress and fosters a profound sense of peace and connection with God. Today, as we explore the essence of genuine praise, we will uncover how these ancient words hold transformative power for our modern lives. To encapsulate this journey, I have composed an original song that I believe will resonate deeply with your hearts and minds. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, all that's in me, praise His name. From the morning till the night, I will sing of endless life. He forgives every sin, He heals my broken heart. From the pit His love redeems, in His grace I take part. He comes like the dawn His righteousness stands strong In His hand I belong Bless the Lord, oh my soul All within me praises me Forget not all His benefits His love will always stay the same Too cool. Thank you so much, worship team, for cooperating. Oh, man. 
<laughs> I was um, so fun. Okay, so I don't know if you know this, but we decided to do an experiment for this Sunday. Um, I actually made up this whole, vi- I'm sure you figured this out, but I made this whole video up um, uh, entirely. I think it only took me less than an hour to come up with the whole sermon intro. Um, AI composed a song from scratch based on the Bible verse that we're covering today, right? And then um, we didn't actually rehearse much with the worship team. Um, But I tried to restrict myself to doing this using only currently available tools, which turns out there's quite a lot. Like I could literally not do my job here uh, on, on, on the Sunday. Um, we're kicking off our series called Genuine Praise Today. Um, and so, um, I, I don't even know, but I, I often, um, I chat to Juniper. Juniper is the voice that I've used for chat GPT. And so then, uh, actually every single thing that I did could actually have even been done on the car while driving, dictating. So I dictate into WhatsApp. Like half the WhatsApp messages you get from me, they're actually dictated uh, on my phone. It's actually pretty amazing. But uh, I did this example just so that we could, as we start this message, you know, I have literally like one job here on the pulpit today at this church. There's, there's only one job for me as I stand in front of this. But can you imagine if I was to outsource to AI this exact role, the role of preaching God's word, of, of teaching this church um, about God? You know, uh, it would just be terrible. You know, the, the topic for today is called Genuine Praise Today. It's actually a play on the acronym GPT. Yeah. Did you know, did you know, if you were paying attention to the intro to the sermon, did you know that Psalms 103 is actually an acrostic? Right? It's actually an acronym of the alphabet. So it's A, B, C, right? Aleph, uh, um, but, um, and it's possible actually, uh, you, you may have noticed that. It's possible to put AI in the center of praise. So that's, that's why we've designed this for the whole month. You're going to be looking at this going, oh my goodness, that's it. This is what's been intended all the time. That genuine praise today has AI in the center of it. My goodness, right? Uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. And we need to talk about it. We need to talk about how t- in today's generation, we can actually do all kinds of things to help make our life easier. So easy that we actually forget get the main reason that we are created for. And then we've outsourced the very thing that we're meant to do to someone else or something else. Um, Today's topic, and actually our series for the next two months, is crucial to your life as a Christian and actually even to all humanity. So let's take a look for real, at the passage that we have today. Uh, It's in Psalms 103, verse 1 to 2. Now, the whole Psalm 103 is an acrostic, right? But the beginning sets the tone for this psalm. It goes, bless the Lord, O my soul. Actually, not just my soul. All that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Which were the lyrics of the song, in case you uh, missed it. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord God, that uh, you would help me today. Help us, Lord God, to... um, place you correctly in our life. I pray, Lord, that today as I, uh, 
unpack this psalm, that your eternal word would affect our lives, Lord. Help us as we navigate today's modern life uh, with its amazing tools um, to conduct ourselves in a way that is consistent with how you've created us to be. Uh, We lift you up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know the emphasis that is made, did you notice the emphasis that is made in this scripture? Um, Sure, it's bless the Lord, right? Bless the Lord. But it's not done, it's not said in a flippant way. It's not peripheral. It's deeply personal. It says, my soul, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his name. Today, the topic of the sermon is outsourcing praise. Outsourcing praise. You know, who's got time to actually praise the Lord? Because Spotify has a really great playlist. And anyway, you come to a church where we're always praising the Lord, right? So you don't need to pay attention to this, right? Um, I'm joking, by the way. <laughs> okay, some people are taking notes. Okay, right? Uh, you know, when we were planning the series with our pastoral team, and actually we're doing these two months with, in conjunction with the worship uh, ministry of this church, and they're writing the home group series that we're going to be doing, we wanted to, as we always do here at FGA, we wanted to make this praise and worship series deeply relevant to our real lives. So that we're not just opening the Bible, reading a whole bunch of stuff and going, okay, great, great, great. I'm just going to continue with my life and now I know more things about the Bible. Right? We want to ask the questions, what does praise actually look like today in your life? Like this week, how is praise like this week for you? Genuine praise today, right? Actually, Technology and our modern life is greatly affecting us. There are things that are going on in our world today that I think is actually putting mankind in a very unique position in human history. And so if it's okay, I want to take a little bit of time as we kick off this series and as I start this sermon to sort of locate us in today in the modern era that we now live in with amazing tools that can do crazy stuff. We possess the most powerful tools ever created in human history. I'm going to say a bunch of things and you're very welcome to fact check me, right? I know that now I'm going to veer into not the Bible territory. I'm going to be talking about just the real world that we live in. And so if you think I'm saying some stuff and it's like conspiracy or this is like fake news, fine. It's fine, right? Just fact check me. It's cool. But I'm going to make a couple of statements and I'm just going to get us aware of the kind of generation that we live in. Let's talk about nuclear technology. We now can harness power by splitting atoms. Immense power. There are, there are, there are so many atoms in our world today. And so it turns out that now that mankind has discovered how to get power from splitting atoms that cause a chain reaction or fusing them, my goodness, the access to the kind of energy or destruction that we can get is unfathomable. In fact, they are, they're, they're researching right now SMRs, small modular reactors. You can Google it, right? It's already kind of in testing phase all over new... Portable nuclear reactor, brilliant. You don't need to charge your phone every day. Once every 10,000 years, we'll be fine. They've got nuclear reactors powering submarines right now. Amazing, right? Just by a small uranium pellet, thimble size, has the energy of one ton of coal. And I mention it because Australia broadly is discussing nuclear, right? But it can also destroy so much. And then there's the long-lasting effect of radiation, right? In fact, its destructive power, the destructive power of nuclear technology is the 
is only kept under control due to regulation and global cooperation, right? Why, why do we not have just nuclear weapons everywhere? The technology exists, right? And why doesn't everybody just use nuclear weapons in their battles? Well, it turns out there is this thing called mutually assured destruction. It's one of the main reasons why nuclear power is so tightly regulated because most countries in the world realize that if somebody starts a nuclear war, somebody else will retaliate with a nuclear war and my goodness, that is not going to go well for all of humanity. But we wouldn't have to have discussions about mutually assured destruction if we didn't have the technology to literally destroy our planet, right? So if you imagine in Jesus' time, in the Bible's time, when they were shooting arrows, how many arrows do you have to shoot in the air to destroy the planet? It just, you just couldn't do it. You just couldn't do it. But we live in a generation now where we could. Not that we're going to, uh, don't panic or anything, but the technology's there. DNA. DNA functionally started being useful in 1950. It was discovered a lot earlier, but in 1950, right, it kind of, we started playing around with it. In 1988, we started the Human Genome Project and to make the full genetic map of human beings. In 2003, 92% of the human genome was mapped. And in 2021, which is not very long ago, the remaining 8% fully mapped. With CRISPR, uh, C-R-I-S-P-R, we can now sequence and modify DNA. Like I'm not literally, I'm not making this stuff up. This is things that we literally can do today. The cost of sequencing has gone from $1 billion to um, under 1,000 USD in 2022, right? With, um, you can now buy a dent, a, a a bench top DNA sequencer, a DNA synthesizer for $25,000. The first children with edited genomes have already been born in China after a rogue professor did live experiments. This was just a few years ago uh, with, a, with a young couple leading to the birth of twins Lulu and Nana, right? Lots of outrage, condemnation globally, right? moratorium on it. We can't do this. Why are we all saying we can't? Because we already have the technology to literally do it. Viruses. We know we can make viruses. Let's not worry about whether COVID was man-made or not man-made. Why are we even debating or investigating if COVID was man-made? You know why we're debating it? Because it's possible. It's possible. The these are things that are already within our reach in this era of humanity. And let, let's go to AI, right? Amazing developments in AI. When they launched large language models last year, like ChatGPT, it seems like so many tech companies are now doubling down on AI. But, you know, this is the worst, lousiest version of AI we will ever see. This is, this is the worst. It's only going to get better. Even if it takes one million hours of programming and computing work, even if it takes one million hours to figure out how to do something, right? Do a task five minutes faster. Even if it takes a million hours, a computer will, all, will know that. Once you've done it for a million hours, once you've learned that, a computer can always replicate it. Not like human beings where we pass things from generation to generation and you forget or they, they, they transmit it wrong. Once it's coded in, that's your base already. And so actually going forward, our children will just imagine a world where you can talk to your computer and it will understand you. That's just 
I don't think we're going to go back to, oh my goodness, you've got to use your phone, and you go, one, 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 three, 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 four, 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 five, 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 six, 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 blank. You know, like how we grew up trying to type text messages. That's why everything was abbreviated, right? Now, we could literally just send it out while we're driving. Why am I saying this? Because we live in a time when we as humans, you, you, right now in this generation, can do more than you could ever have done in the whole of human history. I like this quote, a book I would recommend, secular book, but really great reading. Probably one of my favorite books for this year, right? Um, and, and I don't agree with everything he says, but he makes this really good point. For most of human history, the challenge of technology lay in creating and unleashing the power of technology. That means how do we get fire to do more things. Maybe we can cook our food with fire. Great. Or maybe we can fly in the air with aeroplanes with fire. Or maybe fire, and then we can just take fire and, and make that technology do as much as we can. But now it's flipped. Because can you, do you know how much we can do with technology now? The challenge of technology today is about containing it's unleashed power. Making sure we're not destroying ourselves with nuclear bombs, right? Developing viruses that could wipe out the human race, whatever it is. Our challenge today is how do we use technology in a way that is wise, ensuring that it continues, this guy says, to serve us and our planet. I'm not sure if I agree with Mustafa's final comment. But it is telling of the predominant disposition of our world that technology and all that we have should serve us. And we're going to fight that premise today. Why is it so appealing, though, to like have a robot vacuum, clean your house, and then do all these types of things. Why is that so big? I think there's a part of technology that appeals to our desire to be like God, to not need God. And so um, I like what one theologian said it so well. You know, technology helps us to be omnipresent. We can be in multiple places at once. I can be on a date with my wife and chatting with the staff team and coordinating things around the world. I'm like, hey, I'm in multi places at one time. I can be joining in live calls on video chat all around the world. In fact, we could be sitting at home and we can see what all of our friends are doing on holiday around the world. Oh, man, it's so good. But it's kind of artificial, right? Like, because we are actually in one location. We're, we're not, sorry to burst your bubble, but we're not actually there. Whenever you see somebody post food pictures in Bali, like, you're, you're, you're not actually there, Right? And then what happens is we're so present, we're all aware of all the things that are going on when we're on a date with our wife. But you're not actually at those places where all the chats are happening. You're, you're present. You're, unfortunately, you're, you're, your soul, all that is within you, for some reason that God made us, we're, we're only can be in one location at a time. But technology gives us this artificial sense that we could be omnipresent. I, I don't even need to be around. And we can still organize the anniversary. We can do all the other things. We're all good. Technology helps us to be omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing. Omnipresent is all everywhere at once. And, and now we are all-knowing. Because we can reach for our phone and things that we don't even know anything about. My goodness. Now we know. Now we know. We're so all-knowing. You know, um, Google is a little bit out there. I don't even use Google anymore. I use Perplexity AI, which is so good. It's not an endorsement for that. But you know, it's, 
it's it's so cool, right? Because ChatGPT makes up stuff, but Publexity is an AI search engine that has links to other websites and solves, answers the question instead of just giving you websites that you have to look at. You know what? You don't even need to read the Bible yourself because you can Google all your theology questions about God and life. You can be omniscient, right? But it's kind of artificial because you actually don't know everything. I, I hope I'm not like telling you something you don't know. Surely you realize you don't know everything. Wow, do you know how much fake information there is out there? You can Google stuff and just get the most complete. That's one of the reasons why we're running this theology Q&A, which is taking place um, tonight after the 4 p.m. service, is because I'm constantly getting questions from people around things that they've read on the internet. And it is just nonsensical. So let me tell you, you don't actually know everything just because you have Google on your phone. It's the appearance of knowledge. And for some reason, God made us with finite knowledge, not infinite knowledge, omnipotent. And this is probably the topic of our illustration today, the t technology gives us the feeling that we're all powerful. We can resequence human DNA to have children the way we want. We can, most of the food in our world today is genetically modified. I had a dinner with a friend of mine who will remain anonymous and she has a dog who is specifically bred but requires five surgeries in their life because they can't breathe. And so by creating that dog, that dog, in order to look the way it looks, to be so cool and cute for Instagram, requires surgery all of his or her life to literally survive. This is the world we live in because we are so powerful. We can create animals the way we like it at our whim. We're like kids with dynamite. Do we have wisdom to wield this power? Now, I haven't even, and I deliberately tried to pick all these obscure topics because I get the feel that usually when a, a pastor comes up to preach, they're all talking about social media. Oh, social media, TikTok, you know, terrible social media. My goodness, right? I want to talk about something a little bit different. But, my, but social media is powerful. It's affecting us in so many ways. So I want to ask the question, actually, so how are we? Using technology today. That's the, I think that is the question of our generation even. Regardless of whether you're a Christian, you're not a Christian, whatever. You're living in this generation where we have so much technology and power in the palm of our, our hands. How are we being careful with our use of technology? And is it destroying our life? Is it destroying what we're meant to be doing? How are you using technology today? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, do you know why we were created? Do you know what the main goal of mankind is? There's a very famous... Um, there's a very famous writing that's actually uh, in the core doctrines of most of the mainstream churches. Um, and it's called the Westminster Shorter Catechism, right? And it's a series of questions and answers to help people understand the core parts of theology. The first question in the Westminster um, Shorter Catechism goes like this. What is 
the chief end of man? That is the first question in this, that, that is this sort of Q&A that answers major theological questions. And the answer is, man's chief end, why each of us are even here, is not to do as much as you can before the age of 30, to accumulate as much wealth, to get your children into med school, to live in that sub... The chief aim of mankind is not to have the most happiness possible in life. The chief aim of mankind is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's equivalent to praise. How do you glorify God? Praise. We were made to praise. What happens if we go about using all our immense power and technology and all the things and we, we outsource the very thing that we are supposed to be doing? You know, if you've never heard this before, maybe you're new to Christianity or church, uh, you might think, my goodness, this is a terrible goal. Why, why would people want to have as their chief aim to glorify God? God can just sort himself out and my chief aim will be to go to Disney World a hundred times. Like, that surely can be the chief aim of mankind, right? So I'm going to take a little bit of time just to recalibrate and understand why this is actually a really good goal, okay? Glorify God, enjoy Him forever. Why do we glorify God? Number one, I think it just needs to be said. One, we don't set the goal, all right? So firstly, I know you don't really think, oh, no, no, I am my own life, I can do it. Firstly, Unless we are the creator, unless you're sitting here and you think, I am the creator of myself. I am my own creation, but not only am I my own creation, I have created the entire world around me. Then I put it to you, you are not the creator. Yep, and it's fine if you believe there is no creator, fine. If you look around at this amazing world that we have and all of creation and you think, man, this is just random, fine. But if you believe that there's a creator and there is a purpose, right, surely you recognize you're not that person. So you don't get to set the goal. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. That's what Isaiah says about us in Scripture. We were made for God's glory. Secondly, people need the Lord. We need to glorify God. We need to lift Him up because as we extol his praises, as we lift him up, other people will see, oh, wow, this is really good. If we lift up the fry kway tiao at like Malay Kitchen or whatever it is, right? If we lift up the whatever, whatever thing that we're on, the new car that we drive, then other people will look at that and go, oh, man, I need that. I need that car. I need that. But you know what? People need more than their food or their cars or their games. People need the Lord. And so as the people of God, we need to glorify God so that his name can be lifted up because we all need God. If people were enough, then we could just glorify people. Right? We could just glorify our children. Oh, our children are so amazing. They're going to save the world. Oh, my wife, my husband is so amazing. We could, we could. But we all know that actually this has limits, which brings me to the third point of why we glorify God, because all else falls short. If you're going to glorify something, don't glorify something that is temporary. Don't glorify something that is not worth the glory that you're going to give it. Right? I mean, despite how things are marketed to us in life, we, we, we know, surely, that this new product that we buy or this new venue that we want to go to, right? It, it, it's not deserving of all of our praise. 
my soul and all that is within me is going to glorify this whatever thing I'm going to put, right? My ATAR score and all that is within me. <laughs> it falls short. And we get disappointed by the children that we idolize, by the, the career that we idolize, the products that we buy, whatever it is. Um, Revelations 4.11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We want to actually glory, glorify something that is worth glory. Lastly, God is good. God is good. And so that's why it says that we are to enjoy God forever. And there are many not good things for you to use technology on. There are very not many not good things for you to focus your mental energy on all the time. Think about them. Meditate on some of these things. Right? It, Anxiety is on the rise in our society. There are good things for us to dwell on. There are good things for us to praise. There are good things for us to glorify. And God is good. Psalms 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. You know, this is not, this is not, we're talking about praise, right? This is not really, it's not about a religious exercise or a set of rules that you need to follow. Giving God glory is not a formula of rituals. That's why it says, uh, bless the Lord, all my soul and all that is within me. There has to be a reality, a genuineness. That's why we're calling it genuine praise. There has to be a genuineness in it. At the same time, it's not nothing either, right? It's the entire reason for our being. So sure, it's not a whole set of rules that you have to religiously follow. But just because you don't have to follow rules, it doesn't mean we just go and do whatever we want. Some part of it has to actually give God glory. Also, I want to clarify that uh, we don't glorify God because He desperately needs it like some insecure person uh, and that is needy. All right? He's not like Maui and Moana that gets stronger with the number of praises of people. Oh my goodness, if we can collect a million followers for God, then God will be great. My goodness, God was already great. He's already big. He's already God. Our praises just affirm already reality. And we don't want to be people, actually, that praise things that we know are bad and false. <coughs> we praise God because it's true. We actually have one job, the greatest commandment. If you are a Christian and you're here today at church, our greatest commandment is that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all your mind. Listen to those words. That's the first commandment. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. That you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But we are unable to love our neighbor as ourselves if we first don't glorify God. If we don't first love God. Because He will show us what good love is like. So let's focus on how we can give God glory. You know, in, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, there's the story of the golden calf. I, I, I don't know if you've heard of this, right? The, the Israelites, they, they are um, they're in Egypt, right? They're enslaved for many years. And then God sends Moses, right, to free them, right? It, this is the uh, Prince of Egypt story, right? Um, and so they're all, they're all leaving Egypt, slavery, Jews till today celebrate that Passover. They celebrate being um, released from captivity. And then God does miracle after miracle in the lives of these people. The Red Sea is parted. Uh, Egyptians are, are defeated. Uh, food comes down from heaven. Water comes from rocks. Like amazing. You should read the Bible. It's amazing. Fantastic. 
And then they get to this place, and then Moses says, oh, praise be to God. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go up to the mountain of God. I'm going to hear from God. And, and, and this is where we get the Ten Commandments are coming down. Well, hold on. It's going to take two weeks. It's going to take a while. So I'm going to go up to the real God that you have seen do real miracles. And when I come back down, we'll have the Ten Commandments. So he goes off. But in those two weeks, you know what happens? They're like, ah, can't wait. They can't wait. They, they're like, they begin to lose trust in God. They got, you know what? We have the technology to fashion our own gods. We can do this. We got, you got gold, you got gold, you got gold. Good. We all take all our gold and then we can make a calf. That's what they do. They force Aaron to make a calf so that they can worship what they already know is a fake God. Right? Surely they know this is a fake God. They wanted to make their own idol, but I, they actually wanted, actually, not that they wanted something to worship, because I don't think they actually really wanted to worship it. They just wanted a convenient proxy so that they could get back to their lives. Like, oh, you know what? I need somebody to, to, to blame. I, I, I want my children to study really hard. So I want to pray to something so that my children can study really hard. So yeah, Moses is not around. God's not around. I just make a golden calf. And the golden calf actually served them. The golden calf was made to serve their purposes so that they can continue with their regular lives. So that they could say, Wiley, you better behave or the golden calf is going to get golden calf is going to get you, right? Like, they didn't actually want to worship the thing. They didn't actually think the thing was God. They literally fashioned it with their own hands. Uh, Romans 1, 21 to 22, one of my favorite verses, makes this really clear. Something about us as humans, right? That although they knew God, and Romans 1 says that all of us are without excuse, from knowing God, even if you've never been to church, even if or, we're all without excuse because creation, if you should read Romans 1, it's amazing. It says, Creation testifies of God's divine power. You're supposed to look at the mountains and the stars and the universe and the molecules and the atoms and whatever it is and go, My goodness, this is amazing. And so we're actually. Without excuse. And then it gets to this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then claiming to be wise, they became fools because they exchanged the very glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. It's like they would put their devotion and their attention to going online on social media to look at mortal men and what they're doing and what they're eating at the moment. Videos of cute animals or, oh, uh, you know, you, you got to ask yourself, what recharges you? What is it that you do after you've done your whole days of work? You're, oh man, I've done. I looked after the family, the kids. I've done my job. I've done. Oh, now I get to recharge myself, and I'll put on images of mortal men and birds and animals and creeping. And this will be amazing because they're shooting each other. <laughs> amazing! We fashioned our own god to capture our own attention. To do our own things. I think our calves are just a little bit more fancy. So, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his name. Can we ask today, and I, I want to get really serious if I could. Can we ask this question? How close to the line can we get to this statement, oh my soul, all that is within me, bless his soul. How close 
can we get to that line before it's actually not true of us? Can we still say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, if we're not paying attention? If this whole week, we're, we're just doing other things. Can we say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and we're praising God while we're scrolling through social media? Is that, have we crossed the line and then we're not actually praising God? Or maybe it's okay if you're driving and you're praising, because that's a little bit remote control, but scrolling through, I don't know, right? Where, where are we going to draw that line? That's a question that you are going to have to answer yourself, that we're going to grapple with as a modern-day church. This is actually really, really serious, because as you've heard us say many times here at FGA, we're not interested, actually, in being some kind of fake church where we just rock up here and we go through the motions of Christianity. The, 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 the facade of Christianity is incredibly useless. In fact, in many ways, it's oppressive because it forces people to just do a bunch of stuff that isn't even genuine. So we want to actually talk about the real thing. So where is this line? If, if, if we were created to praise, if you call yourself a Christian and you say, hey, that's right. I am going to bless the Lord with all my soul. I am going to keep my commandment. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, and strength. I am. I am. Okay, great. Where is that, where is that line? Can we do it? If our actions don't follow, have we crossed the line? If it's just words that are empty? We, we just do it because mom and dad tell me i got to go to church, I'm going to do these things. Then have we crossed the line? We're no longer blessing the Lord with all my soul. Can we do it if our desires are elsewhere and what we really hope for actually is that service will end and we can go to Malaysian Kitchen or whatever it is or, or play volleyball? Like, have we crossed that line? Have we crossed that? Like, where is it? At what point does it become genuine worship? And then at what point does it flip over to, oh my goodness, I'm so glad for FGA. They've done it all for me. I can just show up at church, praise and worship, done, right? Heard God's word, message, done, right? And then I can, just, I can just leave. And then I can get on with all the important things I'm actually really excited about doing today. Like, is it okay to live a life where you're doing so many things and then you just have God as something you outsource? Church can handle it. Worship can handle it. Spotify can handle it. YouTube sermons can handle it. TikTok Bible verses can teach me songs and what a youth group will handle it. Handle it. Because we live in an environment now where it's all possible. I'll tell you now, it's really possible. You can outsource praise. You can outsource the reading of the Bible. You can outsource your understanding. You don't even have to understand the Bible at all yourself. Just Google every single time. But at what point? This is the real question we've got. And that's why we have to grapple with it over the next two months. Because we run the risk of coming to church, devoting our whole lives to this thing. And it's fake. It's fake from the point of we're not actually keeping the greatest commandment. We're not actually giving God praise. And the very reason for which we have been created has now been outsourced. So, look, if I could just be really honest, right? And I, I feel like Jerusha did an amazing message last week. She, she, this is like part two of Jerusha's message. So if you didn't hear it, Listen to last week's message, right? But so much of our lives, actually, and just think about it today when you came into church. So much of our lives is like Jerusalem's message where the things of our life consume our attention, right? Our family, our responsibilities. We've got issues, maybe health issues, career issues, right? Like, I, I, I don't know why you've come to church. I, hopefully, there is some kind of issue that we can help you with. We'd love to help you with that. But... 
Hear me when I say this. The actual point of our lives is not the dealing of, with of issues. The more we make our particular problems or the, or the happiness of our children or the happiness of our husband or whatever it is, the more we make that the center and focus of our world and our, and, and our God, then, then the more we're detracted actually away from what we've been created to do. So don't make your issue your God. God needs to get bigger. Our eyes need to be taken off the world and our reliance needs to be taken off the things of this world and God needs to be lifted up. That's what praise, that's what praise is. We're going to do one month of praise and then, and then one month of worship. But praise is broadly lifting up and worship is broadly bowing down. The, 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 the word for worship is like to, 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 to lie down. <laughs> Man's laughing because I said in the training for the home group, I'm like, the word for worship is prostrate. And man, like, it's not prostrate. It's not. Oh, it is. Oh, I said prostate. I said, the word for lie down is prostate. And then the whole worship team's like, I'm sure it's not prostate. I'm like, down, it's down. But no, 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 prostrate. The word for worship is like down. It's like prostrate, right? And then praise is like lift up. It's to glorify. It's to lift up. And so we're in this series now for praise. We are to lift God up. He should get more time. He should get more attention. God should set the agenda for your life and not the issue that you're facing setting the agenda for your life. We were made for this. He is worthy of glory and praise. Actually, when we praise God, something changes. When we put God in focus, something changes in us. Our priorities rearrange. Our values shift. We model what we see. And if what we see is God and Jesus... We change. The focus is on God. You know, David, David is, David is talking to his own soul. He's saying to his own self, bless the Lord. Come on, my soul. That soul that just gets so easily distracted, that gets like buffeted around with life. All that is within me. Come on, bless the Lord. Forget not his benefits. Um, you know, Jesus, so all through Scripture, there are reminders. So I'm hopefully not saying anything that's just going to surprise people. We're just trying to make it relevant for the everyday lives we're currently living in. Jesus would say in the Lord's Prayer, why would he begin the Lord's Prayer like this? Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the start of the Lord's Prayer. That should be the beginning orientation. Hallowed means it's a petition that God's name be revered and treated with the utmost honor and devotion by all. That's what hallowed means. So we have to ask this question, are we, is this a thing that we do? What, what does it mean to put our focus in on God? And maybe we can have the worship team up. Um, may, what does it mean to put the focus on God, right? Maybe it means that you are interested in God. Maybe it means that you're meditating deeply in the Word of God. That you lift up His words. You, you, you put weight to it. Maybe you're studying the Bible even. Right? You're, you're asking questions. Your, your, your attention, you're trying to work these out. I, I love waking up in the morning and giving God my very best of the day. So I, 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 um, I just, I'm going to throw some personal examples in here. Not, not because I'm like, oh man, I'm the model to follow. But I just want to say that we're all grappling with this. And so I've had to very deliberately, in order to be a genuine pastor, right, things in place but also I feel like as I put those things in place 
That's what a genuine Christian would do. And so for the longest time, for years and years, I've been waking up in the morning and I've been doing my devotion. God is going to get the best part of my day when I'm the most awake. First, I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to glorify Him. Maybe it means giving Him undivided time, actual time, because we're not omnipresent, right? So we can't be everywhere at once. So when we're time to be with God, maybe it's the time that we shut everything away and we actually try to go right. Oh, my soul, all that is within me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless your name, God. I'm going to give you praise, God. Turns out that's why I've been created. That's why I exist. Not to be the mother of my children, not to be the driver of people to kids' activities, not to be the scolder of people to clean up their room. I have literally been created. Literally been created to praise God and enjoy Him forever. Meaning that His presence affects your life in such a way that you change, that you grow. Glorifying God, glorifying God doesn't change God. Let's just be really clear about this. It changes you. That's why I really like A.W. Tozer's quote. Great theologian. If you've got time to read his stuff, it's so good. But he says this. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Because our concept of God influences our worldview. It influences our behavior. If we think there is no God, it's all made up. You know what? This whole world, it exists for me. Then our worldview is secular, materialistic, right? And then our behavior becomes that way. And then we go, yeah, yeah, you know what? I don't need to be accountable to anybody. I'm just going to, I hope I have a really great life and I'm just going to pursue the things I want to. We're all good. But if our view of God is, He's God. We are His creation, made in His image. And if we raise Him up, we seek His agenda, we seek His face, we're attentive to His voice, we're trying to hear what He says. My goodness, it's going to change your worldview. It really will. The things of the world will grow strangely dim. And you'll be like, hey, God, what is it you want me to do today? And for as long as I've known God, He has not said, watch YouTube until you fall asleep at night. Like, my goodness. <laughs> right? If somebody's saying that to you, it is not God. We need to actually grapple with the fact that as a church, and I know we're changing, so we've got a whole bunch of people joining us now, right? We don't want to change the focus of what this whole church is. That's why our theme for our 30th anniversary is praise. And I'm hoping you'll fill in praise reports because we want to give God praise. Because we want people who read that to go, my goodness, I'm so glad that God is good. Because He needs more attention. Um, I want to end with this and if we could have like all eyes closed I want to just if I could maybe end with an altar call and I know we've still got two months left of this whole series and we're just really going to unpack how we do this thing well praise and worship to God but here's the question I want you to grapple with because we need to actually answer this question of the line if we have one job if the chief aim of man is to glorify God, if our greatest commandment is to love our Lord, our God, with all of our heart, soul, and strength, if this is, if we have one job, can we outsource it? Because it's possible in today's generation, right? And so I 
would like, while all eyes are closed, if you would like at the beginning of this series to make a commitment, and maybe you haven't even figured it out yet. You haven't like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I don't know how I'm going to reorganize my life. I don't know what I have to give up. I don't know what I'm going to end up doing. But today, as I'm sitting here, listening to this message, something needs to change in my life. If that's you, I want to actually invite you to take a courageous step and stand up. So while we're all sitting and eyes are closed, if you would like to make an actual commitment to say, God, the church that I go to is spending two months to recalibrate so that we praise and worship you well. I I want to make a commitment for these two months. You have my attention. Lead, reorganize my life. Help me as I recalibrate. Help me to actually pay attention to the one thing I'm meant to be doing with my life. And I want to make that commitment. If that's you, can I get you to stand up? I want to pray as, as, as we close. Just as we're all, it's between you and God. You don't need to look at whoever else is doing it. But it's just something that as you're here, you're saying, look, I'm aware the line can creep in my life. I'm aware that even though, you know, uh, I've been a Christian for so long, things can move, priorities can move in my life. And I just want to make sure that in these next two months, God, you, you hold me accountable to paying attention to the one job I have to glorify you. Father, I just pray right now for every single person who's standing. Lord, even as you're, you're convicting hearts, as you're working within our midst, I pray, Lord God, that you would reorder us. Help us to do praise well. Help us to be a people who glorify you, who are a great testimony to you. Help us to reflect you in, in who we are and that we would be able to truly, authentically say, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless your holy name. I pray for each person and their families and their homes and their real lives that you would begin to speak to them and reorder them. And we pray for this church that you would sweep through and that there would be transformation, not at the surface level, but in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, the service is over. Um, If you'd like...